Howdy everyone in land. It's been a while since I've made a, a video with me rambling in it. Um, as you no doubt can tell, the last few videos that I made were on the WeatherStar 4000. Mainly the software presentation side. Well, I did mention in a description that I wanted to talk more about the hardware. This video is going to be more of a generalization of the hardware, not really technical, in-depth, memory layout, function, stuff like that, because I'm not sure how much you're going to be interested in listening to me rambling on about that. So if you want that kind of a video, just let me know in the comment section below. I will try to put those videos together in more detail. Um... Since I normally don't do sophisticated YouTube videos like this, I don't have presentation software that I can lay out charts and things like that. I don't I don't know how to do that and I don't have that kind of stuff. So it would be it would be theory of me talking in pencil and paper type stuff. That's that's pretty much what it would be. Uh anyways, uh this is the Weatherstar four thousand box right here. There's a couple of of these videos on YouTube from other um, YouTube content creators showing this box off, so I don't. I'm not going to get into it externally. Um, but what I will, but what I want to do is I want to talk about what's on the inside of this box. And and why I find this box so interesting. Well, as you may know, this machine was conceived in 1988. Um, Probably didn't get released until 1989. Uh, 1990 is when the majority of the networks had these boxes. And in case you don't know, these boxes were installed in head-ins of local cable providers. And that's how the Weather Channel was able to deliver a local forecast unique to each area. Uh, and this is the machine that did it in the 90s. And there, there's a few other ones they had running simultaneously. But this was the most iconic and primarily used one. Uh, and I like this machine for a couple reasons. One, I grew up with it. And two, the hardware design is unique. And it follows on a very similar path as vintage or retro computing. Uh, just because of how it is. So... Inside this machine, we took the front off. Now we're going to take the top off. Set it aside. And no, I don't have a tripod or anything like that. I don't do professional YouTube videos for a, a living. But anyways, so normally there would be two ribbon cables plugged in here. And those would be plugged into two cards, one here and here. And I have the cables unplugged. And one of these is the audio input-output subsystem. The other one is general purpose I.O. So, like, triggering um, advertising pre-rolls on videotape machines and stuff like that. That would be in the head end. There's switches, there's terminals back here that would do that. Screws. So, normally in this slot here would have been two batteries which were four volt batteries and they're long since gone because I didn't need leaking all over the place. And this is the charge controller and standby switch over. So what this is designed to do is when this thing loses power, this battery system keeps the memory contents active. So we're not losing the, the, you know, the contents and memory because the way this actually works is the program is volatile. It's downloaded from the satellite subcarrier and stored into this memory. And that's that's how it works. And that is on a carousel. So in between program downloads, you, you're going to have warning information. You're going to have local forecast information before the next program download. So it takes a very long time for this thing to download its program. So if there was a power glitch at the head end, and if it was in the midst of you know, a severe weather outbreak, you can't afford for the hour to three hours this machine would have been down while it's re-downloading its program because you can't get warning information out fast enough. And this is before cell phones. Now with cell phones and wireless 
alerts. You don't need all of that anymore so much. But back then, it was a real a real thing. So, yeah, that was very important. But in this case, it's not important anymore because I can re-download the program into it any time I want. Anyways, so let's start off with card number one. And card number one is the main CPU card. You've got four cards in these machines primarily. Um, there were some machines that had a fifth card here, which is the sensor board. And the sensor board is very rare. And it would have plugged in on this connector back here. And you, you would have wind, barometer, temperature, you know, various outdoor weather station type sensors. And uh, this the sensor board would actually relay the weather information currently from the sensors on the bottom of the screen known as the lower display line uh this machine didn't have that none of my machines do so the weather information would have had to have been transmitted by the weather channel so let's start off with this board here and we're going to pull it out one thing i forgot to mention um the first board i pulled out this is the cpu card this is the graphics processor. That is the I.O. card. Contains the front LEDs, modem, keyboard, RS-232 port on the back, plus the GPIO. And this is the data and audio card. But first, let's take a look at the CPU card. So here we have the CPU card. Um, these ROMs have already been reprogrammed, but these were originally the ready systems vrtx roms see this board ran on a real-time os and the real-time os was stored in the rom not upgradable so if there was a bug in the kernel you were stuck with it you had to you had to deal with that until a program can get into ram and potentially take over and patch any bugs out that there may have been um, anyways in my case i decided not to use the original uh, weather channel code base because a i don't have the documentation to it and i'm not that good at 68k reverse engineering uh and b it's twc proprietary code anyway so i just went ahead and replaced it with my own assembly language programmed bootloader but outside of that we what we have is a main processor that is a 68010 not the most common one, which is, it, it's basically a 68,000 with a couple of opcode improvements, loop enhancements, and the ability to do virtual memory because when there's a bus error or an address error, it stores additional information on the stack so you can recover from it. The 68,000 did not, so you couldn't implement virtual memory. Um, and then we have a backplane connector. This is just your standard 96 pin Euro DIN. Um, and the back plane is basically the uh, v what's called a VME bus, which was very popular in industrial computers at the time. I'm not sure if it still is. Most of the ones you see now have du dual slots because it's 32-bit or greater. This is 16-bit, so it's only got a 16-bit slot. But this is a uh, VME bus um, with a twist. Here's why I say it was a twist. Because... The Weather Channel applied micro sign or applied micro technology, whoever engineered it, and then Northern Telecom manufactured it, decided to take the existing VME bus architecture and then they modified it a little bit. So it's not pin compatible with the VME bus, but the bus grant request lines, address, and data lines follow the VME standard. But the IRQ lines have changed and they moved things around because they added some additional voltages in here that are not part of the Stand, VME bus standard so you gotta watch out for that so you can't take a VME bus card and put it in here for diagnostics it's, you're just gonna blow shit up so you can't do that um, so we have the 68010 we also have 4 megabytes of RAM here and actually this one most 4000s don't have 4 of these chips installed so there's 4 megabytes of RAM this one's filled out with 6 megabytes of RAM this jumper activates that memory that additional 2 megabytes it's not enabled, so it's only going to see four megs anyways. And this is actually, if you look at it, you have these four chips here and then the other eight of them right here. 
the reason why it's look it, it's kind of looking like they're separate on the board and reality is they are so the first two megabytes can be accessed by this main processor and only by this processor see the graphics card has a bus master it's also got another 68010 and it can act as a bus master so it can read and write from this memory independently from what this cpu is actually doing um, unless it's trying to access the same location at one time, then this one will pause because there's logic circuitry over here that's responsible for doing that. But I can show that in the schematic and talk about that a little more in a more detailed video if it's something you guys want me to do. Because um, I don't want you falling asleep halfway through the video and be like, this is boring. Uh, anyways, this is the first two megabytes. It starts at location zero. It ends at 1F, FF, FF, or 2, you know, 2 megs of RAM. Uh, only accessible by the CPU. So this is where the main program would reside, along with anything necessary that this only this board actually needs. Uh, this 2 megabytes, which has now got 4 megabytes in it, is accessible by this CPU and the rest of the system bus. This starts at 2,000. Well, not 2000, 200000. It ends at 3F, FF, FF, or, you know, 5F, FF, FF, if you have this jumper on. But yeah, there's this is accessible by the graphics card. This is accessible by any other bus master that's on the system. Currently, the only one, the only one that acts as a bus master is the graphics board. The IO card and the data card are slave devices only. So the CPU, the satellite could download everything to CPU. This would contain a RAM disk that has a shared X allocation table between this processor and the video processor. So the video processor can reach back out into this memory and grab things through a DMA concept than what this, without this thing even needing to know. Um, anyways, these two are PALs. They are PAL 16L8s, which is a combinational logic. These two perform the memory refresh and timing functions for this memory bank, along with all the buffers here that connect it to the system bus. Like I said, this can be tri-stated off and accessed independently from this processor here. And these logic switch, or these logic gates allow that to happen. These, one of these is the interrupt priority encoder. Do you have an address decoder and one of them X is the overlay. So as we all know, the 68,000 reset vector when it first starts up will um, start up from location zero. This ROM gets remapped and after so many clock cycles and, and one of these pals is responsible for doing that. Uh, this contains the system password for logging in remotely, as well as this contains your advertising crawls that would be in the LDL. So when the cable company or TWC or whoever decided, hey, I want to add some advertising local to your area, it would be in this chip here. And anybody that knows the 4000 software, especially the simulator, you would see the crawl running at the bottom of the screen during the local forecast. That information is stored in this chip. Um, this over here is the real-time clock. This is responsible for the clock you see in the top quarter of the screen as it's ticking during the local forecast and all that. That's all done by this chip. Um, this is the memory decoder for bus mastering. So when something external that needs to access this memory, this controls that. Also... It, it controls the addressing for the extended memory too. Um, and then we have a, let's see if we can find it somewhere in here is the watchdog timer. So this circuitry here controls all of the bus mastering access as well as timing for the processor and accessing all of this stuff as well as accessing this. And, uh, we'll get it all, we'll get into all that with a schematic. Um, but there's a, uh, watchdog timer in here and that's why there's this halt light and run light so this thing this processor has got to execute code that constantly kicks the watchdog otherwise this will turn red and the whole machine will cycle so that is basically um 
the CPU card in a nutshell. So let's move on to the graphics card because it's a lot more interesting. This is the graphics card. There, there was two versions of this card. This is version seven. They also had a version five. And the difference between the two is this gen lock section is entirely different. Um, but this is uh, the version 7.0 graphics card, codenamed Sergeant Pepper. This is known as the Sergeant Pepper graphics adapter. This guy has, once again, we have another 68010 CPU. At the same time, we also have an Intel 8031, 8032 based CPU. So we have a dual processor on this board. And again, we have another VME bus, but this card cannot be written to. From anywhere else this card in order for this card to re to access any resources it has to do it on its own power the only thing you could do to this card is you can actually send an interrupt card oh, man that's annoying my my light keeps going on and off because the phone says it's overheating but whatever welcome to pixel 3a anyways uh this has an interrupt request line coming from the main cpu so you can send an interrupt to this card um, but that's it. This card can also send an interrupt back to the CPU. There's also, this card is not an auto vectored. If, if you know the 68K, there's no auto vectoring. Well, there is auto vectoring, but this card's not auto vectored. It's manual vectored. There's a latch in here. One of these latches acts as a interrupt vector register. So what you would do is you would set the vector latch known as IVEC. Um, and then you would send an inter interrupt request IRQ, which we can get into those a little bit more specifically later, back to the CPU. So then the CPU knows that this card triggered an interrupt, which will allow the CPU to read the interrupt vector address. Um, and then you, you can have your interrupt vectors written a specific way. So depending on what vector is written here, determines which code executes. So you can have this processor go off and say, I need to retrieve this information, or I need you to set this information, or I need you to do this or that or this or that. You can vector all of that out without needing a, a large if else block because there's nothing worse than having if command equals this, if else, if else, if else, if else, if else. You can do away with all of that by using the, the vectoring, the, you know, IRQ vectoring. But anyways, we have the 68010, the communication back to this chip here. This chip here is an Intel chip. This is the frame buffer control processor. This is responsible for everything that happens on screen. Uh, the crawl on the bottom of the screen, the rolling you see of the Travel City's forecast or the warning, all this is controlled by this processor. Radar animation, flipping between screens, viewports, all this is done by this chip. So this chip communicates with this chip through this, this guy right here. This is a first in, first out or FIFO. Again, we have a couple of system memory, system ROMs here that, that are just bootloaders. So when the program is running on the CPU, it can send an interrupt back to this card. And then this card realizes it's ready and then it executes the bootloader and starts downloading its program into the memory because the program is not on this card. Again, it's got to be downloaded into the memory. So these are the two SRAMs for this chip here. And this is the SRAM specifically for the 8031, which is the MCS51 series. Um, this is another programmable logic. This is registered logic, so I don't have the logic inside this chip because these are not easy to do. Uh, this this uh, is basically a pixel clock gate. So the pixel clock is runs at 14.318 megahertz through this board because it's NTSC. And that is the master clock for this chip. And there's some signals that go between the FPGAs and other things. Uh, that are required for video timing. This chip handles that. This chip here, these are these are timing um, chips. Well, one of them is that generates your horizontal vertical sync timing and things like that. This other this other one is a divider network that allows the 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 way the Genlock circuit works is we have a 3.57 megahertz color burst crystal that's connected to this oscillator. Well, this oscillator is also connected to this divider network so that steps it up to 14.318 megahertz which this 14.318 megahertz this self oscillates it but this can also be PLL locked with the signal coming off of here so the way it actually works is when you have an input video signal in here this whole stage gin locks to that 
through the color bursts, uh, not through the horizontal sink, not through vertical sink. It does it through the color burst. There's an LM1881 that acts as the sink separator. The vertical sink, horizontal sink does get used, but only for timing the color burst. And that's how all this, this insanity works. Uh, this chip here is known as the RAM deck. Random access memory, digital analog converter. This is responsible for the graphics you see on screen. This is also responsible for the degradation that you see on these older units. When the colors start freaking out or going crazy and don't make sense and it's all glitched up, this chip is responsible for that and this chip goes bad. When these chips go bad, that's what happens. As soon as you uh, replace this chip with a new one, you're fine. It works perfectly again. There's other things that go wrong on this board too, but that's the most common thing. Um, so the frame buffer control processor and 8051 has a UART. Well, this UART is programmable. You can program it to be asynchronous like RS-232, but you can also program it to be synchronous. So it has a clock and a data line. Well, that clock data line is what communicates with this FPGA. This FPGA is the frame buffer control FPGA. This is responsible for switching viewports, doing the crawl roll, all that stuff through this guy. Um, it controls these encoders. This is a 16-bit counter that counts each pixel that's on the screen. So as the line's going across or as the line's going across the screen and it returns to the horizontal blanking period and it comes below and it just scans its way down to the screen, every group of eight pixels is one tick of that timer counter. These are the muxes. These are responsible for switching and selecting what's in this video memory, which there's two megabytes of, by the way. This is responsible for switching the data out of this memory to this process or to this RAM deck for each period of the pixel clock. Uh, and there's eight pixels at a time. It's handled for one tick of this counter. Well, this counter obviously overflows at 65,536. Back to the beginning again. So that'll give you roughly... 682 lines and some odd pixels. So there's a section of memory around three quarters in to the end that is unusable because the timer will overflow or this counter will overflow and it repeats back to the beginning again. So inside this FPGA is a paging register and that paging register selects which bank you're going to be looking at. So there are four banks of 682.579 whatever lines. Uh, and the read-write access to the memory. And that was one of the limitations to this design is this memory is not dual port. So this processor to read and write to this memory is interleaved with the access of this putting out to the frame buffer. That makes drawing really slow. That's why on-screen graphics for this thing is, is, is slow when it draws out, which it's only 8 megahertz to begin with. That's the clock signal. But still, it's slow to begin with because of the timing requirements for this thing to work. So this processor has a uh, DTAC or data transfer acknowledge on a bus cycle. And if you want to know the 68K bus cycles, I suggest you Google how all that works. But um, anyone that knows the 68K knows that we have a DTAC line. This holds the DTAC line when a pixel is being accessed by the, the you know, the 14.318 megahertz pixel clock, the counter timer clock. This, these pals here are responsible for switching and muxing this between its banks from these counters. And these muxes here, which these are FPGAs, but they're programmed as muxes, uh, are what isolate the 68K from the RAM deck or this memory. So this memory can be piped to go this way or it can be piped to go this way. And you can do full 16-bit writes in and out of this memory. And when you're writing a program to talk to this stuff, you really want to write 16 bits at a time because it'll increase the performance. You can do 8-bit pixel, single pixel writes. Works fine, but guess what? That's two bus cycles, and it takes time to execute that because then it's got to reach out to memory, read the next instruction to know what to do for the next 8 bits, and then come back. It, it just takes time. Anyways... So this is a typical 8051 setup with your address latch because the address, the first eight bits of your address is multiplexed with the data. And that's kind of what this does. That's what this chip here does, actually. 
This chip is a memory access decoder. It's a PAL, and it's a decoder that selects this guy, this guy, or this guy, all the registers inside here as well as over here. Um, this is the watchdog timer circuit in health indicator light for this processor that you have to continually reset. And there is the same thing here. This is the watchdog for this one. So we have the video memory here that we draw into. This gets displayed through this processor here and all that works all simultaneously. And we have one big happy medium. And then this is where your satellite video in, local video in, out, and composite sync goes. And this is the bypass relay if there's no power. So uh, that's it for this board for the most part. And it's pretty pretty uh, complicated board. And I kind of like it. It's, it's very complex for what it really is. Now this right here is the I.O. card. This card here was a pain in the ass to write a program for. And I can get into details with that in a later video. But uh, yeah, it was a pain in the ass because I don't like the way this is designed. The 8051 CPU talks directly bit banged across the 68K bus. What? Anyways. Uh, so we have our ROM here. 8051 CPU, we have two um, programmable I.O. controllers, PIO, so you've got a port A, port B on each one, along with some internal SRAM, as well as timers. Now, this also has a modem. There's a timer in one of these that's programmed to generate the baud rate, or the baud clock, for the um, modem, as well as over here, this is the RS-232. It's like a 16450. So your baud clock for this is created by one of these. And then this is a 300 or a 600 baud modem. I don't remember. Uh, anyways, uh, AT keyboard, it's connected to the um, internal serial port of this along with this modem. So it's multiplexed between the two. So if the modem is in use, you can't use the keyboard. If the keyboard's in use, you can't use the modem. It was just switched between the two. And then the GPIO from here acts as the dial pad for the modem encoder, one of these tone encoders, um, as well as the general purpose IO that goes to the back plane. And they're also going to the front panel LEDs here. So those two chips are responsible for controlling the front panel LEDs, the general purpose IO, as well as one of these chips here. I forget which... So we have the, um, it's either the 5087, yeah, it's a 5087, it's a tone encoder. This is, generates the DTMF dial tones from one of these two chips. Uh, and then we just have simple bus address decoding, interrupt logic. This is not a bus master device, so this can only talk to the CPU back and forth. And that's all it can do. And uh, that's it for the I.O. card. I mean, it's really... It's really simple. And then finally we get to this card here. This is the data and IO card. Audio data revision um, 8.0. And that's exactly what it does. This controls all your audio input and output as well as the warning tone. The beep 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 you get you hear when warning as well as you know data decoding logic and all that stuff. But uh, we have this shield here and this is where the radio receivers are. So uh, through the magic of video editing, let's get that shield off. Now with the shield removed, which, you know, it's over here, but um, this is the baseband input that comes from the old analog video cipher satellite receiver. Um, and this would listen to different RF subcarriers that were on the transponder centered around the video signal, kind of like FM stereo. You got a 38 kilohertz subcarrier with your left and right audio multiplexed in. This is very similar to that. So there are three receivers here. So receiver number one's IF strip is the FSK encoded serial data stream that the program and the data and all that stuff is stored on. Then these two are FM audio channels. So I don't know if they used them or not because it had external audio inputs, but these were for getting alternative audio. So 
the Dan Chandler narrations or anything specific to the, the, the 4000 at that point in time could be sent through this audio carrier that's separate from the main carrier, main audio, the national audio. The national audio is encoded audio in the horizontal blinking period of the uh, did, or video cipher that has to get descrambled and decoded, but that's for a whole different video from somewhere else. I don't want to get into those details. But there's the uh, the IF strip for FM audio 1 and 2, and they come out over here. Ratio detectors, amplifiers for each one, and then off into the muxing circuit. Over here is the uh, audio tone encoder for the, the warning beep. Um, it's just simple CMOS logic with some analog resistors, capacitors, and gets into an op amp and gets mixed in here to that mess. Uh, but the real important bit here is this this chip right here. That is a frequency shift keying NRZI decoder, or non-return to zero inverted, as identified by this data point right here. The subcarrier that contained this information was a 115K baud, yes, exact same baud rate as the RS-232 serial, but it was NRZI encoded. This decodes the mark and space frequency of the RF subcarrier. It's like 7.4 megahertz, somewhere in there. I don't know. I'd have to look up the tuning of that circuit. It's not important for this discussion. Uh, this decodes it back to ones and zeros in the, in the uh, NRZI format. Well, that goes down into this processor here, which you see is missing. But however, this is an Intel... Uh, 8044 or 8344, which is the same thing, it's an 8031, but there's a difference. It contains a specialized UART for being able to decode SDLC frames. That's the kind of frames this thing's encoded in. So, the subcarrier FSK NRZI data that came down from the satellite is NRZ encoded, but it's also an SDLC frame format. And that frame format was decoded by this processor. And there's a patent that explains the protocol format and everything is, you know, sit down. For example, the Weatherstar 3 that predated this one, all of the text-based products, this thing would decode as well. And that's the text that you saw on screen, like today, tonight, tomorrow. Uh, any of the text-based products you saw on screen were taken directly from S3 frames. But um, that's what that chip does. And this was the ROM that this chip used to boot. And of course, the way it works is there's a FIFO because this chip could be downloading data bits from a stream at whatever symbol rate, okay? There could be interruptions in the, the satellite data stream. There could be whatever else. And that gets pulled up into this FIFO. This FIFO stacks up the frame. And once the frame is complete, this will send an interrupt out to the CPU that tells the processor program, hey, We've got an impending frame ready for us to review. So then the 68K CPU will come back and it will read this memory out, which contains the packet that just got decoded over the satellite feed. And then the CPU goes off and does what it needs to do with it, whether it needs to. Is it in the interest list of this unit? Do we decode it? Do we not decode it? Do we move on? What do we do? Uh, that's All that is piled up in here. Uh, and of course we have simple bus interface logic that communicates back with the VME bus back to the 68k CPU uh, these were the PALs which are those guys right there and this one was dedicated for decoding the address map for this so if it needed to access this FIFO or if it needed to access these latches to control the audio or things like that that was handled by this this would place the specific items in memory where they needed to be these two handle the bus address decoding so when the 68K needs to interrupt this guy, or if it needs to write a value to this processor, or if this processor needs to write a value back to this latch to be read by the CPU, it could be done through these. Again, this board was also not auto-vectored for interrupts. This was a manually vectored board. So there's an IVEC latch in here. And again, depending on the data types coming in from the data stream, it can write the different IVEC number into the latch, load up the FIFO and trigger the CPU. And the CPU will know, okay, which data handler do I need to execute? I don't need to run a big if statement again. I, if it's this vector I'm handling, 
uh, S3 data. If it's this vector, I'm handling program downloads. If it's this vector, I'm handling graphics and blah, 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 down the list it goes. So that's how this board works. Uh, there's the LEDs over here, which indicates whether their audio is present or not. No audio two, no audio one. This is again, there is a, um, right here, this dual timer is the watchdog timer that has to be taught, hit by the CPU. And as long as that watchdog timer is in good standing, this health indicator will be lit up. This is the two audio signals. If there's no audio coming in, these will be lit up red. And this light will blink based on NRZI frames coming from the, the satellite. And actually this light here is wired directly to the right strobe of this FIFO. So as long as this processor is dumping in byte for byte into this FIFO as the frames being decoded, this light will flash with each byte that's written. So, um, and uh, that's it for the 4000 as far as a general hardware overview. Um, if I hope I didn't confuse you too much. And if uh, there's any information that you would like additional, just leave it down in the comment section. So uh, if you've sat through this whole video watching this without falling asleep, I congratulate you. I'm not very good at doing videos like this, but it's just, it's just who I am and it's what I do. But um, at any rate, thank you for watching. And if you have a comment, please feel free to leave one.